scientists do a good job of explaining the world around us, but they don't have an answer for everything. Nobody does. We're glad of that fact, though, because if people had answers for everything, we wouldn't be able to make videos full of mysterious ancient technology. There are some head-scratching ancient mysteries lined up in this one, so let's get started. The correct name for our first discovery is the Petrocile Treasure, but it's more fondly known by archaeologists as the Hatching Hen and the Golden Chicken. The Hall of Golden Gothic 4th Century Artifacts was discovered in a grave in Pietrosale, Romania in 1837. Rather than being found by professionals, the valuable objects were found by laborers from the village while quarrying limestone in preparation for the construction of a new bridge. Until the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb in the 1920s, the Pietrasele treasure was considered the greatest ancient gold discovery in world history. 22 objects were unearthed in total, including a large fibula in the shape of an eagle's head, a patera with Gothic figures carved into its side, and a neck ring with an unusual runic inscription. The laborers were poor, so they cashed in on their lucky finds by selling them to an Albanian businessman called Verusi. Unforgivably, Verusi broke several of the finds into smaller pieces to make them easier to transport. He got away with smuggling the treasure for a while, but the authorities caught up with him a year later. The pieces now belong to the National Museum of Romanian History. The understanding of metallurgy happened at different speeds in different parts of the world, but it appears that the concept was fully understood in India long before anywhere else in the world. We say that because of artifacts like the Iron Pillar of Delhi, which was forged from a single piece of iron around 1,500 years ago. As if that weren't impressive enough, it's also covered in a rust-proof miso-white coating, which means it's remained rust-free for all of that time. While the Iron Age officially began in the rest of the world around 3,200 years ago, the discovery of small metal and iron objects in and around Telangana demonstrates that it began in India around 1,000 years earlier. Telangana benefited from being surrounded by huge amounts of iron ore, and so it makes sense that the people who lived there would get to grips with the idea of mining for iron long before the rest of the world did. Alexander wrote of the quality of Indian steel 2,300 years ago, noting that it was the highest quality he'd ever seen. We're not surprised by that. Based on the evidence, the Indians had already had thousands of years of practice by that time. Why did the Vikings seem to make such an easy job of conquering other European countries and races? Were they really that good on the battlefield? Or did they just have the best swords? It might have been a bit of both, but their swords helped. They were of such outstanding quality that they effectively became the world's first branded product. You knew you were buying a genuine Ulfbert sword 1,000 years ago because the maker's name was stamped on the blade. Historians believe that Ulfbert swords were the first in the world to be made by casting, with melted iron and carbon poured into a mold and left to cool, thus doing away with the impurities that often weakened the ancient swords of other races. This method of sword manufacture wasn't mastered by any other European race for 200 years after the Vikings came up with it in the 11th century, which begs the question of where they got the idea from. Some experts suggest they acquired the secret from a small Asian tribe after conquering them, but there's no direct proof of any such event. Perhaps they came up with it themselves, and we should admire the Vikings for their brains as much as their brawn. Going rooting through the collections of the world's greatest museums might feel a little bit like cheating, but we're going to make an exception for our next artifact. It's a beautifully carved winged object of uncertain name, and it's a product of either the 2nd or 3rd centuries. The experts in the Met Museum of New York, where the object is housed, think it's probably a counterweight for a harpoon, which is an idea backed up by the fact that it was discovered in Alaska. Historians believe that the object, which is crafted from ivory, was used by a culture that lived on either side of the Bering Sea between Siberia and Alaska almost 2,000 years ago. The symbols and patterns carved into the sides of the counterweight are hard to interpret, 
but they might be representations of the spirits that the owners of the weights hoped might lend their strength to the harpoon or bring good fortune to a hunting trip. It's thought that items like this were still common in Alaska until the end of the 9th century, but production suddenly stopped for unknown reasons. Of the few examples that still exist, this one is thought to be the best preserved. During their time, the Vikings were the most accomplished sailors in the world. People of the time claimed that their proficiency at navigating the sea was down to their use of sunstones. These sunstones were said to be able to locate the sun's position even after it had gone down or when it was hidden by clouds, which would have made navigation much easier. The properties ascribed to the stones make them sound almost magical, which is why historians tend to view the concept with suspicion. As of 2010, we're more inclined to believe they were real. That year, a sunstone was recovered from a shipwreck close to the Channel Islands. The artifact has been extensively studied, and it's been proven that its calcite structure produces a double refraction of sunlight that reveals its position even when it can't be seen with the naked eye. This would explain how the Vikings were able to reach North America without the aid of a magnetic compass, and also how they were able to outmaneuver all of their opponents in Europe comprehensively. All a Viking captain needed was a sunstone and a sun compass to go wherever he pleased, whenever he pleased. The entire archaeological site of Saihuite in Peru is full of ancient wonders, but everything else almost gets forgotten about because of the existence of the marvelous Saihute stone. Many centuries ago, Saihute was where the Inca people came for ceremonies, gatherings, and religious festivals. During those occasions, they gave thanks to the water gods, and we believe that water is what the Saihute monolith is all about. What historians can't agree on is how far that water connection goes. One theory is that it's just an elaborate sculpture carved with decorative channels that allow water to run across it. Some experts believe it has a much more sophisticated purpose, though. They believe it's a topographic mini-replica of Saihute as it appeared at the time, and the monument is a sort of scale model city that they could use to plan and test irrigation systems. There certainly seem to be areas of the monolith that make sense as rivers and water tunnels. If this really was an irrigation testing device, the Inca may have been even more ahead of their time than we already believed. The site of Sahasralinga in India is as popular with science fiction fans as it is with archaeologists. That's because the numerous carvings in the stunning rock formations at the site look so much like the famous dials from the Stargate series. You'll find the carvings in Karnataka if you ever want to go and take a look at them yourself. Not even the local residents know who made these carvings. The site was deliberately flooded to become a reservoir many years ago, and it seems that all knowledge of what happened before was lost at that time. When the reservoir was drained and Sahasralinga was revealed, archaeologists had no idea what to make of it. Some of the shapes and carvings come with inscriptions, but unfortunately the inscriptions are too badly weathered for us to be able to make any sense of them. Curiously, there's no sign of any tool marks in or around any of the carvings. It's almost as if they were made using some kind of advanced stone cutting technology, but that would be impossible. As far as we know, no such technology existed when the stones were cut. This is now a world famous site, but we still know precious little about how it was created. Not all ancient shipwrecks keep their treasure aboard when they go down, but every once in a while, marine archaeologists find one that has. And the one that turned up off the coast of Sicily in March of 2020 is especially exciting. When the ship went down around 2,600 years ago, it shed its cargo of ingots all over the seafloor, and those ingots have been proven to be made of orichalcum. This extremely rare cast metal was said by Pluto to be made in only one place in the world, the lost city of Atlantis. Many experts have spent centuries searching for Atlantis and found nothing, but could this ship have been there before it met its fate? If so, does it offer a clue as to the location of Atlantis? 39 ingots were found at first, but further investigations identified a further 47 nearby. The wreck was found not far from Gela in Sicily, which might be telling, 
The Gela of 2,600 years ago was a wealthy city known for its production of fine, ornate objects, so the orichalcum was most likely headed for its factories. Until the discovery of the ingots, it had been suggested that Plato had been mistaken about seeing it, and the material was nothing but a myth. Now we know better. Plato said that only solid gold was considered to be more valuable than orichalcum during his lifetime. We wonder what kind of value experts will put on it today. Archimedes is credited with a number of the most incredible inventions of the ancient world, including the Archimedes screw. While he deserves acclaim and credit for most of his inventions, he has nothing to do with the Archimedes screw whatsoever. It's been mistakenly associated with him, but all he did was write about an invention that he saw in action when he visited Egypt in the year 234 BCE. He was told by Egyptians that the invention had already existed for some time by then, and that the secret of who came up with the idea had been lost to time. Whoever invented it, it's a remarkable feat of engineering. It's the first water displacement pump in world history, and has been used to pump water from the Nile River. There's even a suggestion that an Archimedes screw was the centerpiece of the irrigation system that fed the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. A possible reference to the existence of such a screw has been identified in an inscription associated with King Sennacherib of Assyria, who lived 500 years before Archimedes was born. How have we forgotten the name of such an important inventor, one who came up with a concept that's still used all over the world today? The London Hammer, which is sometimes referred to as the London Artifact, is a classic example of a seemingly out-of-place artifact. Discovered in London, Texas, USA in 1936, it's a hammer embedded in a rock concretion. What makes it so problematic from a historical point of view is the rock that it's embedded in is 400 million years old and appears to have grown around the hammer. That's enough evidence for some people to say that the hammer must also be 400 million years old. From there, conspiracy theorists generally conclude that it's either evidence of time travel, proof of alien visitation to Earth, or a basis for the idea that human civilizations have existed and become extinct on our planet long before the current human era. The tool is of a design that was popular with miners during the late 19th century. It's possible that soluble minerals in the limestone might have formed a rapid concretion around the hammer after it was dropped, thus giving it the appearance of being part of the same rock. But until that can be proven, the artifact's existence will remain problematic for scientists. Do you remember what we all used to do before video games and the internet when we needed to entertain ourselves? If you're one of our younger viewers, then perhaps you don't. But our older viewers will. We used to sit around a table and play board games. That's a tradition that goes back centuries and can be traced all the way down the ages to the ancient Egyptians playing hounds and jackals. They probably didn't use that exact name for their game. It was decided upon by Howard Carter after he found a gaming set inside the tomb of Amenemat IV. A more descriptive name for the game would be 58 Holes, which tells you what the board looks like. Each player had 29 holes to monitor, and was given a set of sticks. One player had dog-headed sticks, and the other had sticks topped by jackals. Gameplay wasn't drastically different from the more modern game of backgammon. In fact, backgammon may even have evolved from hounds and jackals. There were probably a few differences between the rules of backgammon and the rules of hounds and jackals, but unless we eventually find an ancient set of instructions, we'll probably never know. Whether or not you view the Saqqara bird as an invention depends on how you choose to interpret it. You could just write it off as an ancient Egyptian carving, and it would be hard to disagree with you. In doing so, though, you'd also be writing off the fact that the 2,200-year-old sculpture just happens to have the perfect proportions for flight. It's aerodynamically perfect, and its thin, flat wings are more similar to those of an airplane than they are to those of a bird. During the 1970s, a research team decided to test the flight properties of the Saqqara bird by making a larger model based on the exact same proportions and found that it could fly and glide with no problem. 
It might just have been a simple child's toy given to an Egyptian child by a skilled craftsman. Or it might have been created by someone who understood the basic principles of flight, even though they had no means of putting a human being into the air at that time. We're not saying that the ancient Egyptians ever discovered the secrets of flight, but it's possible that they contemplated the physics of it. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!